Je m'appelle Philippe Janot, je suis le directeur de la section Québec et de la section des Prairies du Conseil d'affaires Canada-Chine. Bienvenue au quatrième webinaire de notre série en six parties pour la Chine, euh, prêt pour la Chine. Aujourd'hui, nous, nous offrons un guide pour exporter vers la Chine. Pour les fins de notre présentation d'aujourd'hui, le webinaire se tiendra en anglais. Par contre, tout au long de la présentation, je vous invite à poser vos questions en français ou en anglais en utilisant la boîte Q&A située au bas de votre fenêtre de visionnement. Il me fera plaisir de relayer les questions de l'auditoire à nos invités. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth webinar of our six-part China Ready series. My name is Philippe Janot, and I am the director of the Quebec chapter and the Prairies chapter at the Canada-China Business Council. Today, we are pleased to offer you a guide for exporting to China. Throughout the presentation, I invite you to ask your question in French or in English using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your viewing window. I will, I, will happily, uh, I will be happy to relay your questions from the audience to our guests. For today's presentations, we have a robust agenda covering logistical, legal, and financial aspects of exporting to China. For the first part of the presentation, I will be joined by John Lee, Sales Manager at DTS Advanced Logistics to discuss the logistics of exporting to China. Following, Victor Tao, Managing Partner at DS Lawyers Canada, Vancouver office, and Cindy O, oh, Lawyer at DS Lawyer Canada, based in the Montreal office, will share legal insight and the best practices to properly structure a business relationship with buyers in China. Finally, Emily Delphi, Product Operations Lead at Export Development Canada, and Kevin Sullivan, Senior Manager, Mid-Market and Export Development at Export Development Canada, will offer valuable information on assistance programs offered to Canadian exporters. Without further ado, I will invite John Lee, Sales Manager at DTS Advanced Logistics to join me on screen. John, thank you for participating today. I will now give you the floor to tell us more about, about the export logistics to China. Uh, John, I believe you are muted, but let me, uh, let me just try yeah. to unmute you. Okay, can you see the uh, the slides on the screen? Here we go. Yeah, we can see the slides, John. Okay, super. Okay. Hi, uh, this is John Lee from DTS of the One's Logistics. So we are CBSA licensed custom broker, warehousing operator, international freight forwarder located in Mississauga. This pandemic seems to slow down some of our activities. Many of ours staying home, no traveling, but on the other hand, the world even moved faster than ever, such as e-commerce, and right now everything digital. China has moved into a post-pandemic era earlier than us. So I hope today's presentation to provide you some tips when you think export to China market. Let's move. To. Before you start, ask yourselves, such as, what's my product? What's my product's function? What's my competition over there? What's my target group? Or even culture concerns? and then ask whom will I sell to? Am I going to sell to wholesaler, to retailer, or to end user directly? Because all the price are different. Are there any regulations to sell my products in China? For example, if you sell cosmetics, nutrition products, you need to first get registration in China in order to start your business. What are my costs and profit? Do the math. At least to see the break even, to see the profit can cover all your costs and expenses. This is very important to make uh, business sense. 
what price terms can I negotiate? Let's move to the next in details. According to INCO terms 2020, there are totally 11 price terms. Four of them are very commonly used. I had it, I had it in the right in the screen. Keep in mind, actually, these price terms are not about price itself. It is about responsibility, obligation, and risks transfer between seller and buyer. Let's see some details. Here you see a, a chart of INCO terms 2020. So you can see from the screen, old 11 basic terms and buyer, seller, from which point your obligation will be end and risk the point of risk transfer. For example, if we go to CIF, means the cost, insurance, and freight. Here, as an exporter, Canadian exporter, you have to prepare, of course, the products, the packing, and then booking the space, pay the freight, buy the insurance until the vessel arrival at destination port in China, such as in Shanghai. That's the, the point of your risk transfer. Next, Canada export process. This is a big topic. We can talk even hours. So because it's a, uh, it's too much uh, too much process and very details. Uh, today I'm not allowed to say, uh, talk more details, but I will provide you a useful website. You can go there to check by yourselves. It is a CBSA, Canada Customs website. It's very useful. I list it at the, uh, the bottom of the, uh, the slides. From this uh, the website, you can check the whole export process and also a very practical checklist for Canadian exporter, what you need to do before you start export. Some of the other points, uh, just keep in mind, for Canadian exporter, such as Form B13A, this form is ask you to provide, provide all the basic information for Canada export declaration. So this is uh, one important form for all exporters you should know. Other than that, as an exporter, you should uh, know how to uh, book space with the shipping line, what's the lead time, do I need the uh, direct shipment or transshipment. Please make, also make the communication with your uh, buyer or importer on the shipping schedule. Prepare the shipping docs, such as the bill of lading, commercial invoice, packing list, country of origin, etc. And then payment terms. These are also important. Do I need the letter of credit, wireless transfer, or partial shipment? Or, sorry, partial payment. Now let's move to China side. China customs process. Today's presentation is a very general and introduction. So you need to consult with your Chinese freight forwarder directly. If you need to participate in this part of the works, but it's better for you to know the flow, especially if there are future problems, at least you know what happened and where. Let's go to uh, the step one. First, 
you need to get the delivery order from shipping line. In most cases, this job will be done by your fleet forwarder. They need to prepare a arrival notice, be updating to the shipping line, and pay all the charges at the uh, discharging port in order to get the reorder. The next step, prepare all required dots for customs, such as packing list, commercial invoice, contract, authorization letter for customs inspection and quarantine, fumigation certificate, if any wooden materials involved in packing and pallets. Special documents. Are there any special documents required for my export items? Certificate of origin. Of course, this is very important to determine what uh, the import duty will be applied to your product. And the customs process. Step three, customs review the value. Keep in mind, the customs have their own way to evaluate the value. But normally, you need to submit your commercial invoice, but be prepared in case the customs need you to provide the further evidence of the price you're paying or the actual value the other support document could be letter of credit, insurance policy, original invoice, etc. If these are needed to be presented, be prepared. Step four, pay import duty and tax. Keep in mind, you need to pay the duty and tax within seven days when the customs issue the duty memo to you. Step four, step five, sorry. Customs releasing. You won't get the customs releasing until all the duty, taxes, and related charges to be paid. This happens anywhere in Canada. It's uh, the same situation. And keep in mind, sometimes the customs will put your ship your cargo on hold for further inspection. For this purpose, you need to coordinate your free tour water to follow up the steps requested by the customs. Next. China import duty and taxes. Please remember, duty tax apply on Chinese import are the three followings. Customs tariff. This is uh, basically uh, related to HS code. So please uh, keep in mind, their total, their total 10 digit HS code. The first six are universal, which means the uh, same as in all countries. However, each country may modify the last four at their own requirement. So you should be prepared. If you are a Canadian export, you should have the, the, uh, the Canadian custom tariff number, the HS code, and prepare for the China side. In order, the, uh, the freight forwarder in China, they can match what's the uh, equivalent to the Chinese tariff, Chinese custom tariff. So be pre prepared by yourselves. VAT, value added tax. This is a kind of consumption tax. Keep in mind, always check with China side because the, uh, the government, Chinese government have the time to time to update this VAT read. The 13% is the most updated one applying for import. But some of the items are different read. Nine, six are different, but you need to check with the, uh, your Chinese uh, the customer to know the details, what exactly 
the rate you should pay. Excess tax, such as tobacco, liquor, jewelry, hand car, or gasoline. This is the, uh, the type of the, uh, the tax the government uh, try to restrict some uh, consumption or try to discourage some of the high-end the product uh, consumptions. Keep in mind, when you pay the duty and tax for China import, duty and tax paid in RMB and the value will be based on CIF price and the paid will be end on yen is dollar value. Next. Keep yourself refresh. As I mentioned at the beginning, many things changed quickly, sometimes beyond your imagination. As a business owner, if you focus on China market, you will need to upgrade yourselves in order to catch up the business development in China. Here, just give you some examples. CIIE versus Canton Fair. Canton Fair, everybody knows, is already passed for 63 years. CIIE, what it means, it stands for China International Import Expo. Actually, this year would be the third year. So it's normally happened in November in Shanghai. You can check all the details by going to the website. The purpose for this is the, the Chinese government the, encourage the more import. So as a Canadian exporter, this might be a good source for you. Hainan Free Trade Port. This is even newer. It just starting from um, this year, just a few months ago, high in Hainan Island, something like in Hong Kong. The, uh, the Chinese government will make it as a uh, free trade, duty-free port. So for the uh, foreign exporters, you can take advantage of doing business there. Except import duty, VAT, consumption tax. Again, you need to check the, uh, uh, the details. There's the, uh, the government's uh, uh, website with uh, the source available. E-commerce. This is very popular in China right now because, uh, again, the government uh, encourage uh, the more uh, medium, small business owner to, doing, uh, to do the business, as well as uh, the foreign uh, business owner doing business in China. Know what is BC, what is CC, and what is BBC. BC means business to consumer, CC means consumer to consumer, BBC means business to business to consumer. BBC, a business module, might be a more applicable for Canadian exporter. You, you can take, uh, take your time to start in more of a BBC module. Bonded warehouse versus general warehouse. Again, the bonded warehouse is unlike here in Canada. We normally pay very high rental charge for the bonded warehouse. In China, there's so many bonded warehouse. The purpose for that is that the government try to encourage the foreign exporters doing business in China. For example, as a Canadian exporter, at least you can take advantage without paying duty and tax until you make real sales in China. That's the advantage you can take. Double clearance service. So when you talk with the, uh, the Chinese customers, they may ask you, hey, can you do, uh, in Chinese word, it's called Xuanqing means double clearance. Double clearance basically refer to as an exporter, you have to do the, uh, the Canadian custom declaration as well as custom clearance in China. Similar like DDP. So when you talk with your, uh, the customers, if they ask you, can you do Xuanqing for me? At least you know what it means and what's your responsibilities. So 
you can keep the, uh, the same page with negotiation with your clients. By dealing with China, you will find challenging, interesting, exciting, or combined. You just need to know how to do it. Do your homework and explore it. Let me finish with the, uh, a story of today. Uh, around the, uh, 13 years ago, when I have my business trip to China, uh, there are two Canadian ladies sit beside me in the plane. They, I found they got so excited. They check a lot, talk a lot. And then I just say, uh, participate in their uh, chatting. I asked them, where are you going? What do you do? They told us this was their first time to go to China. I said, they, where are you going? They said, we are going to go to Yiwu. So I think many uh, people, if you're uh, involved in Chinese business, especially uh, consumer products, you know what Yiwu means. Yiwu is a, a city in Zhejiang province. It's very popular for all kinds of consumer products. It's a wholesaler and distribu uh, distribution center. So by telling this story, what I mean is uh, no matter how much you prepared, the key point is action taking. So do your homework, making your plan, and take action. So uh, that's uh, my uh, presentation today. I'm so happy to share some of my thoughts with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for this uh, presentation and this uh, summary of the uh, logistics of, of, uh, of shipping or exporting to China. Um, I have a few questions that I would like to, to ask you, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic situation with the COVID-19 situation, one of the things we've noticed is that prices of freight uh, increase dramatically. I was wondering if you could give us a bit of a summary of where we stand now. What does it look like? Is it back to normal? Is it, what are we seeing? Okay, uh, for the, the free, there should be a two category. One is the ocean free, another is the uh, air free. So uh, actually, if we see uh, back in the end from end of the uh, March or uh, April, that's the uh, uh, extremely uh, sky high, especially for the air freight. Uh, for example, the end of last year, the air freight from Hong Kong to the YYZ uh, Toronto, roughly around uh, four to five US dollar per kilo. So in April, the uh, the highest you may pay seventy, even seventy dollar per kilo. But even you pay that high price, you won't get space because of the, uh, the pandemic, all the, uh, the shipping lines the, uh, uh, closed, shut down. So there's uh, basically no traffic. Ocean freight are pretty much similar. Uh, but the, uh, right now, uh, because China is now still the, uh, the major uh, so-called uh, world manufacturer, so it's a basic China, like I mentioned, uh, already started the, uh, the production and started export. So uh, it seems right now the, uh, the freight uh, maybe uh, back to the, uh, the normal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so that's a good sign then. Mm -hmm. um, and another question that, that we often have is, uh, so uh, we deal with a lot of SMEs. There's a lot of SMEs in Canada that are looking to export towards China. Um, mm -hmm. There's often concerns about uh, their, their cargo and, and transit. Um, so I was wondering, like, how, how do SMEs protect their cargo? What happens if it's lost or damaged? Uh, who's responsible for this uh, during the transit? Okay, I think these are related to the uh, insurance. Actually, uh, in the, uh, the INCO terms, one is called the uh, CIF, uh, Cost Insurance Free. Uh, please remember that insurance is uh, applying for marine insurance. So, which means during the uh, the ocean transportation, if there's something happened, if the container fall into the in, in, into the sea, and the, <laughs> the shipping line may carry you uh, that part of the uh, the cost. Other than that, I think for the uh, the better, uh, even better protection 
you need to buy the cargo insurance. So in that case, if you, I mean, if you are low value, it doesn't matter, right? If they are the higher value, uh, you buy the, uh, the cargo insurance, you may get the, uh, this to be covered. It's like you're traveling the, uh, uh, by airline. If your luggage lost, uh, the uh, the airline may only cover certain the uh, the, uh, the the portion of the uh, the damage, but if you buy the other insurance, extra insurance, uh, you can deal with the insurance company for the uh, uh, for the cargo value. So you raise a very uh, great question because right now many uh, uh, small business uh, the owner, some of them they want to uh, uh, take chance, you know insurance like they just want to take chance, say, hey, it, it, will, it won't be happen to me. Yes, it, the chances is if it's not happened to you, it's zero percentage, right? But if it's happened to you, it's 100%. So as a business owner, you should always uh, keep in mind. Insurance is uh, by, uh, you know, by a safety, you know, yeah. Yeah, and having dealt with this in the past, I, I would say that the, typically the insurance for cargo is not dramatically high. So it's, uh, it's definitely worth to, to consider it, to look at it, or uh, make sure you don't end up with, with zero at the end with, with losing your cargo or losing your, your goods, right? Uh, it would yeah. be a big impact on the business. Um, again, on about uh, SMEs exports, is, uh, often companies that are maybe starting to export to, to China are faced with uh, exporting or shipping smaller volumes of cargo or, or will not fill a container for ocean freight and they mm -hmm. have to revert to uh, air freight, which is typically more expensive. Is there ways that you can suggest for companies faced with shipping smaller volumes that they can kind of alleviate the higher cost of freight? Okay, here uh, basically there's the, uh, also there's the, uh, the different category. Uh, normally we talk to export to China are uh, is so-called uh, commercial shipment. Commercial shipment means either by marine or by air. That's commercial. That's you. You have the certain volume, size, and weight. But the, uh, for it's like uh, in uh, in one of my slides, the uh, BC or CC or BBC. CC means consumer to consumer. So if you are the, uh, the uh, Canadian uh, small business owner and the uh, sort of consumer, you want to ship some product or sell to China, individual basis or the, uh, uh, the end user basis, you can, uh, you can go the, uh, the personal uh, the parcel, such as the, uh, go to your courier, like the uh, FedEx, UPS, that's uh, the different category they may have the, uh, the different read. But if you go the, uh, the commercial products, uh, you go either the full container basis, it could FCL or go LCL, less container uh, the, uh, the basis. So that is the, the different category. But uh, keep in mind, if you go the LCL, LCL the, uh, the shipping line normally charge you uh, have the minimum read. The minimum read is based on per cubic meter or 600 kilo. Okay, okay. So, so basically there's, there's a few options to, to alleviate fees, but I guess the best solution is to talk to the freight forwarder to have the, the options that are available at the time being. Yes, to check with them the, the value, the products, how emergency, and the, to decide which the, the method you're going to use. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we've received a question from uh, Raphael Forestier, who's asking more about it. Touch, it's touching on the INCO terms. And mm -hmm. he's asking if we can tell him more about FOB, uh, INCO term. Is, is it a popular shipping method with Chinese suppliers? Uh, ocean freight is definitely cheaper than sending by air. Um, I, maybe, and I, I would complement this question by maybe drawing a contrast between FOB and X-Works, uh, which is two that we see very often. Okay, x work means the SM, uh, the Canadian exporter, you sell the products from the point of either your manufacturer, and in case you are the manufacturer, you sell from the point of manufacture. So from that point, the buyer or importer take all responsibilities 
or pay all uh, the charges for that. As an a Canadian exporter, of course, you can sell X works because it's a, a less headache. You basically, you do nothing. Hey, here is the product, you buy it. But uh, you do not in, involve in any logistics. So, but on the other hand, your profit might be lower, very low. But the, I, uh, it, it means uh, the income terms, uh, uh, again, back to my income term explanation. The income term explanation is a, a description of the obligation risks and responsibilities between buyer and seller. So it means uh, the more obligation you cover, the, uh, maybe the more risks you are taking and the more, the bigger profit, it could be by the end. So it's uh, totally depend on the, uh, what, are you, uh, what are you thinking. And if you have the very good the, uh, logistic channels, maybe you can offer them the uh, CIF or even DDP, like the, uh, uh, I mentioned the Shuang uh, Qing. Now, if you, you are, you're talking with the uh, China side, they may ask, can you do Shuang Qing? That means the equivalent to DDP, duty, uh, uh, DDP, du uh, door duty paid. Yes, that's it. You encourage more and your profit might be more. Okay, so so just to uh, go back on Rafael's question, FOB is a popular uh, inco term used in international freight. Um, it, it, it is especially with China. Uh, basically, what it means is that when we use when a company uses this inco term, it means that the risk and responsibility is with the seller until between the factory or or, or the company and the ship. Right, and then the risk and responsibility goes is transferred to the buyer. So it, it, it is a popular term, but we kind of need to be again consult with your freight forwarder to understand the nuances of all these inco terms. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe just a final question. We have a few mm -hmm. minutes left. You you've mentioned um, bonded warehouse. Uh, in your presentation, which is I, I find very interesting, uh, who, who does that apply to most? Because I, like you said, uh, it, it's a me it's a method of avoiding uh, duty and taxation until a final sale. What does that mean until a final sale? Oh, okay. Uh, the bonded warehouse basically, I it's a, uh, here in Canada and China is the uh, the same process. You ship the products and uh, uh, stock your products in uh, the bonded warehouse over there in in China, and you don't pay import duty and uh, the tax VAT until you make sales. That means uh, until somebody uh, okay. Let, 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 let's say you do e-commerce online sales until the Chinese buyer buy your products. And then at that point, you pay duty and tax. So before that, before it's the, the physical, the, uh, the selling happening, you don't need to pay. I so see. that's the kind of the uh, advantage you can take as, a, as an, uh, the Canadian customers. So, so shipping to a bonded warehouse doesn't mean that you'll always avoid duties and taxes. Is that it means that you will avoid it for the time the goods are in the bonded warehouse. So basically, it's a good help for cash flow. So a, a, a seller could avoid, could keep that money until the final sale is done. Correct. So the goods get out of the bonded warehouse. Yes. Don't pay duty tax, but you uh, again, you need to pay the uh, the rent, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Always something to pay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, John, thank you very much for answering these questions. Uh, th th this will uh, close our logistics portion of the event. Um, but before we let you go, I would like to remind the audience that you can reach me, myself, or, or DTS for further information on the topic. Um, I will now invite Victor Tsao, Managing Partner in Vancouver Office, and Cindy O, Lawyer at DS Lawyer Canada, to join me on screen. Okay. Well, apologies for the technical difficulties. My screen has always had uh, also shut down. Uh, so all right. We're all back. Uh, Cindy, I see that you've started your uh, screen share. Um, I just want to make sure that Cindy's there as well. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, I think Cindy's here. 
and I believe participants are still online. So it, it looks like we're back on track. Sorry again for the technical difficulties to the audience. Um, well, Cinder, Cindy and Victor, thank you very much for uh, participating. And, and without uh, further ado, I will, leave you to, I will give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Philippe. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Victor Sao. I'm the uh, Vancouver Office Managing Partner uh, of DS Avocats. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Cindy Ho, uh, starting our firm. Uh, today, we're going to uh, uh, just give you some general information about a few topics uh, of uh, supply agreement and uh, legal regime for exporting in China. Uh, first, a little bit introduction about our firm, uh, DS Avocats. Uh, Avocats is French for lawyers, of course, although I don't speak French. Uh, DS Avocats uh, is uh, international headquarters is in Paris, France, and we have about uh, the last count is I think 22 offices in uh, across Europe, Asia, North America, South America, and Africa. Uh, we are a true international law firm. And in North America, uh, we have uh, offices uh, concentrated in Canada. Uh, we, will, we, all, uh, we also have uh, legal counsels that are called in the United States uh, that can handle work uh, of, uh, you know, in both sides of the border. And our expertise, uh, we are a full service law firm. That is to say, uh, we're a business law firm. We handle almost everything that a business it will require uh, in terms of divisions. As you can see, we have real estate company, corporate division, commercial division, international division. Uh, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, uh, we help our clients uh, from anywhere from uh, uh, daily corporate matters to uh, employment law matters, to tax matters, to uh, various kinds of litigation. And we also have a very strong uh, international trade uh, practice and division, and we have represented uh, large uh, Chinese uh, state-owned companies and other companies, uh, other Asian Pacific companies and Canadian companies in international trade disputes uh, or uh, arbitrations, etc. So without further ado, uh, we're going to get into the content of the information we're going to try to provide to you today, uh, which is broken into two parts. Uh, one, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, supply agreement uh, and then uh, some of the terms and the best practices. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, about the legal regime uh, for exporting to China. Keep in mind that we're all Canadian uh, legal counsels, so uh, we can only provide uh, legal advice uh, for Canadian law uh, matters, but we do work uh, very closely uh, with uh, our uh, uh, partners in China, uh, very much akin to almost one single firm. Uh, we have, DS has uh, representative office in, Can uh, in China, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, but we also have very close uh, working relationships with local Chinese law firm that can provide uh, Chinese law advice uh, and uh, assistance uh, when your company goes into China. So let's talk a little bit about best practices uh, to, uh, to do a supply agreement. So I think most of you will know what a supply agreement is and uh, the, today's seminar being exporting to China, uh, this is probably the single most important piece of document that your company will require. Uh, in general, uh, this is where a manufacturer or a supplier, uh, you know, will, how you uh, uh, produce, sell, or deliver uh, to the buyer your product uh, in accordance with uh, the purchase orders uh, and specifications uh, of the buyer and terms mutually agreed upon uh, between the parties and um, done so in accordance with uh, the applicable relevant laws and regulations. So uh, as in every agreement, uh, there are uh, general terms and there are specific terms. Uh, and then there are terms, uh, general terms related to territory, term of the agreement, uh, and the obligation of the parties. Uh, so these are all should be clearly identified and uh, agreed upon and written out uh, in the agreement so that you can reduce uh, the possibility of uh, future disputes. Keep in mind that uh, the better uh, you negotiate these contracts 
and more specific, uh, you know, you, um, uh, you award these contracts, the less likelihood of disputes in the future. Uh, because this is basically, it's almost like a marriage agreement. Uh, you set out all the terms, you put it on the bottom of the drawer. Everyone knows what's going to happen uh, if things go south and uh, the, um, uh, the likelihood of dispute or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the time and resources and money that you have to spend to fight about something uh, can uh, largely be avoided if you spend the time, money, and resources ahead of time to craft a, a really good a document. So let's get into the details uh, about this. Uh, so here's some of the um, uh, general terms, general provisions, uh, name of party uh, and legal representative. The, here, uh, I think this is, uh, this is a typical uh, sort of point where the Chinese law and Canadian law uh, differs. In Chinese, uh, it is very important uh, you, have, you do some due diligence on the Chinese uh, party and then uh, get the relevant Chinese corporate information, including its legal name, corporate number. And then uh, you've got to make sure that the document is signed by uh, what we call the legal representative uh, in Chinese, uh, so, um, whereas uh, in Canada, uh, you know, we might, uh, you know, be accustomed to uh, or signing on behalf of the company so long as the corporate um, you know, that the board of directors or senior officers give certain persons signing authorities. A lot of times this is very different in China. So keep in mind that uh, the Chinese uh, legal system is a civil, civil law legal system where uh, ours is a common law legal system. So there are significant, significant differences uh, that you have to be aware of. So uh, make sure that you request uh, the documents are signed by uh, the person listed as a legal representative uh, in the company's, uh, you know, uh, incorporation documents as well as the Gong Shang Ju Deng Ji, so the um, uh, the registration documents uh, that you can find uh, uh, from the um, uh, corporate registry. And if the signing officer is not, or if the signing person is not the legal representative, you might run into uh, trouble uh, down the road. Um, also, uh, if uh, you're dealing with, uh, let's say, uh, regional representative office, make sure that you have, uh, you ask for the parent company's uh, authorization, uh, you know, to act as agents in order to sign uh, the agreement and enter into agreement uh, with you. Uh, um, I mean, uh, everything that you do here mostly is because if uh, something goes south, if something goes wrong, you want to be able to find, number one, the right party to sue or to hold responsible for. And on a second tier of that, is you also want to make sure that the people that you're signing the contract with uh, not only have the corporate power and corporate authority, but also uh, have the relevant assets or uh, capability uh, to provide you with recourse or you know when you have a judgment uh, they have something that you can go after uh, that is to say that the beware of uh, shell companies uh, uh, that has no assets uh, that has uh, no uh, track records so here do your due diligence find out who you are signing with and make sure the, the person who's signing the document uh, is the uh, right person that has the authority and the ability to sign to, uh, uh, to deliver to you a, uh, a binding legal agreement. So uh, obligation of the parties. Uh, here is simply as, um, you know, uh, what's the obligation from, for the buyer and from the, uh, the seller uh, you know, um, today we're probably talking about seller being uh, our guys here. So how do you, uh, what you're going to have to do to produce, sell, and deliver to the product, uh, to deliver your product to the seller um, according to uh, purchase orders and the specifications that you agreed on. And order forms. Uh, order forms alone, please be aware, uh, they're not, without the underlying contract, 
most likely is not enforceable uh, against uh, the other party. So uh, always use the order forms uh, in conjunction with a well-drafted supply agreement. Uh, you know, this is a schedule or appendices uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you're including the contract and what, every time when you do uh, send products, use a new order form, um, you know, to complete uh, each either trunch or each order. Uh, exclusivity, territory, duration, and language. So um, when you supply to uh, a Chinese company or, uh, you know, uh, any foreign entity that is, uh, sometimes people will ask for, uh, to be the exclus exclusive agents uh, for that territory or for a territory that you can carve out for them. And this, uh, you know, a lot of times it's beneficial to both parties if the uh, buyer uh, is willing to uh, order certain quantity that is satis satisfactory to the seller, then uh, you might consider granting them uh, exclusivity to certain territory. Uh, and then obviously the territory, the uh, exclusivity is bounded by uh, terms such as how big the um, territory is and how long the duration is and the mechanisms uh, that you will come back and modify that and also uh, terminate that exclusivity uh, or territory uh, if certain conditions are not met. And in terms of language, uh, here we're talking about uh, the language of, uh, the, um, uh, of the document. Um, uh, I guess uh, the important part is uh, when you're dealing with a Chinese party, uh, they, know, they will want to see in the language that they can, uh, they can understand. So you provide an English document, but uh, you also provide a Chinese translation. Sometimes that's good for negotiation. But always remember to uh, uh, put a caveat uh, in the sense that the, the, um, the Chinese language is only for information purposes and if a dispute arises, uh, the English language is all governed. So uh, next, uh, technical description of the products. Uh, I guess here um, is uh, where uh, you, the, the purchase and sale contract, you should be very clear of all of the description of the product and the packaging uh, so that there's no room for uh, guessing or uh, different interpretations so that you can avoid uh, any potential conflict down the road. Supply agreement, uh, the, the, the next terms, uh, inspection, quantity, warranty, again, uh, you know, clearly define the qual quality control mechanism specifications and clearly state all of your warranties, what is bound, what are you bound by, what are the carve outs, and you also define very clearly mechanisms, how you handle uh, returns or rejections of uh, your product. Uh, and warranties and remedies, uh, this is, you know, most of the time is going to be uh, very heavily negotiated, but, um, you know, that, uh, I'll leave that to, uh, you know, it's too much to get into the details, so, uh, uh, consult with your legal counsel and then uh, see how you deal with those. So I think I've uh, gone overboard uh, with time, so I'll let my uh, colleague Cindy Holtz uh, take him over from now. Thanks, Victor. So uh, basically other provisions, um, I think uh, Victor had mentioned, uh, obviously we could probably do a whole day course on the supply agreement uh, itself. So we're just gonna go over a few of the key terms so that you have at least red flags that you can raise. Uh, one of the things I would say, even before thinking about the supply agreement and when people are considering uh, going uh, to do business, whether it be China or elsewhere around the world, is really to protect your intellectual property. The first thing I always recommend is that you uh, register your trademarks and IP. Uh, China has a first to file regime, which means that the IP will need to be uh, filed first. If not, you will have issues down the road with reobtaining your name um, and we're talking about your trade name 
Uh, we could also think about Chinese translation. Also think about your domain name. So for example, abc.cn, uh, those are things that we could, uh, we recommend that you do early on. Uh, yes, there are some costs, but they're relatively low, especially compared to repurchasing same uh, afterwards when there is an issue. In the supply agreement itself, obviously uh, we want to make sure that your intellectual property of your product or services are protected and that the Chinese counterpart will not be uh, reverse engineering or using your trade name, uh, you know, not in accordance with your procedures. Uh, sometimes we'll ask that uh, marketing be approved beforehand so that you have a certain control and review on how they do things, sometimes ch Chinese translations. We want to make sure that your brand name and that your product is well protected in that regard. So the agreements, usually this is a provision, once again, that's quite lengthy, but that is very important to make sure your rights are protected. Um, once again, even before we go into a supply agreement, just starting the negotiations with the Chinese party, we strongly recommend that a NNN, which is a non-disclosure, non-use and non-circumvention agreement be signed. Um, NNN provides for the confidentiality, non-competition, and non-solicitation. Um, these are quite basic, even if you're doing business elsewhere around the world. We want to make sure that the information exchange, for example, pricing, product descriptions are kept confidential. We want to make sure also in conjunction with the exclusivity provision, um, for example, that uh, the buyer on the Chinese side might be only selling your products and not, not other competitive products, especially once it's supply agreement is terminated, you might want a certain period of time so that they have a non-competition. Uh, same thing for the non-solicitation, want to make sure that your key talent in uh, Canada or your uh, resources or sourcing in Asia or elsewhere is protected and that your buyer will not uh, circumvent you and just go directly to the source. Uh, another item that uh, we also need to provide in the supply agreement is obviously the delivery time. Um, I know that due to COVID, uh, this has caused a lot of delays. It could be as simple from what I'm hearing from our clients, as simple as missing some packaging and then, you know, the whole system is delayed. We want to make sure that the delivery time is, is clearly provided for so that parties understand both the obligations, but also to provide a certain amount of latitude so that in the event of unlikely events, such as a political upheaval, uh, you know, natural disaster, uh, labor dispute, that you have a certain amount of uh, timeline that you could readjust accordingly. Um, obviously, COVID has also brought to light that the location of suppliers is also very key and important. So you might want to ask your own suppliers if they have a contingency plan in place, maybe perhaps diversify your suppliers so that you have um, suppliers in different areas to avoid any delivery delays down the road. Um, these are other terms that are also very important. Obviously, uh, prices need to be specifically provided for in the agreement. If there is any fluctuations um, due to commodities or components and you want the price to fluctuate accordingly, please make sure that it's clearly negotiated and provided for in the agreement. Um, also do note that because of the exchange rate fluctuations, it's essential to protect your profit margin. So you may want to speak to your bank to see if there are any solutions that are available to you, for example, hedging. Um, obviously, in terms of the payment terms and the penalties when the payment is delayed, we want to provide those clearly in the agreement. Um, you know, we generally recommend either upon shipment or 10 days upon shipment rather than at the receipt of products because that provides a certain level of uncertainty uh, for the Canadian uh, seller. Uh, we also want to make sure that any penalty interest, if they're provided daily, monthly, yearly, that those are clearly stated in the agreement so that you have a certain amount of certainty uh, in the event that the payment is delayed. One of the things I did want to mention is that uh, and some things that our clients often see is the currency controls. Uh, unlike Canada, where you could send money freely, Chinese does have uh, currency controls. Uh, so they do need certain formalities to be approved by the bank and the state administration of foreign exchange in order for uh, funds to be transferred outside. Um, so one of the things that you should uh, that we recommend our clients do uh, from a more practical side is to perhaps send some reminders beforehand. Um, things that I've seen is uh, the banks may require, uh, you know, translated agreements. Obviously, translated agreement cannot be done overnight. So you want to make sure that you provide all of those things and that um, your Chinese client has uh, prepared uh, the transfer in advance um, and that the payment can be done in due course.
Um, another important thing, obviously, is customs and taxes. John had mentioned this a little bit in advance. Uh, obviously, there are tariffs that are charged on uh, products imported into China. Uh, you do want to make sure and provide clearly state in the supply agreement who is responsible for such uh, items. Uh, same thing for taxes. In our clauses, what we generally recommend our clients to do is that the price is uh, exclusive of all customs and taxes, including any withholding taxes that could be applicable. So we want to make sure that that's clearly stated in the agreement so that there isn't any ambiguity. If it is not the case, then please make sure, as John had mentioned, to verify what those rates are so that you could include those in your pricing in advance so that you are not selling at a loss, obviously. Um, I think that time is running short. I will finish perhaps with this slide and then um, we will talk about here uh, the applicable law. So in many cases we see uh, you know, negotiations and contracts and we fight for having a Canadian law and Canadian courts. Uh, one of the things that we generally recommend as uh, Victor has mentioned since the beginning is uh, at the end of the day, if something goes south, we want to be able to enforce the judgment. Uh, Canadian judgment uh, rendered according to Canadian law may not be enforceable in China, actually will likely not be enforceable in China. So what we generally recommend is that we put the Canadian laws in the agreement, but that we put an arbitration in Hong Kong, which is enforceable in China, and that the arbitration be held in English. Um, as John mentioned, uh, Hainan province is dubbed as a free trade zone, so it's setting up to be a very good arbitration center as well. So that is something that we could consider. Actually, my colleague Victor is a certified arbitrator uh, in Hainan, so uh, do know that there are Canadian lawyers who can be certified to do such arbitrations in China who understands Canadian law. So um, those are, I would say, are some of the recommendations that we would have in terms from the legal side. Um, obviously, if it's arbitration, all costs are out of pocket, so you want to provide clearly for who is responsible for such fees. Usually it's the party that is losing or perhaps some shared mechanism that's already provided for in the agreement. Um, so I don't think we have enough time to go through over the legal regime, but perhaps I'll just do a few points just to make sure that your certifications are, uh, you know, uh, done in China for Chinese uh, authority, according to Chinese authorities. Uh, same thing, do you have red flags for labeling and packaging that has to be in accordance with Chinese requirements? Um, do you know that there's products that are, are permitted, prohibited, and restricted? So verify what category your product is um, related to. And last but not least, uh, there are different mechanisms of setting up in China. Uh, feel free to reach out to obviously your legal counsel uh, or DS uh, if you have any additional questions related to that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy and uh, Victor, um, for, for this presentation. I, I, we do have a few questions, including a few questions from, uh, from the audience. And I um, just wanted to start maybe with a question from Antonio Arias. Um, he was asking, how do you authenticate a legal representative for, for the supply agreement? I believe, Victor, you were mentioning uh, finding the proper person to sign the agreement. So he's wondering, how do we identify those? So as Victor had mentioned, um, those uh, the legal representative is actually provided for in the corporate registry. So just as in Canada, you could pull a corporate profile, such information is available there. Um, generally, what I recommend, obviously, your law firm, you could reach out to, uh, to us and we could pull that out quite uh, easily. If not, um, you could also reach out to the trade commissioners who also generally have such information for free. Excellent, thanks. Um, also a question from uh, Raphael Forestier. Um, do we need the certificate for China Compulsor Product Certification for Supply Agreement, uh, which is the name of uh, manufacturer, applicant, standard, a technical requirement, and does that need to be in English and, uh, and Chinese? Well, um, okay, so uh, I think you're talking about the, um, uh, uh, the China Compulsor Certification. Uh, yep. Uh, when you're selling products to China, uh, most likely uh, you will require this kind of certification. And even if some, for some product that doesn't, uh, you know, problem may arise, um, you know, uh, when the custom officer demands a, a CCC certificate. So it is better for uh, anybody who's thinking about exporting to China uh, to get ahead of the game and try to, uh, you know, get on the CCC certification. There's uh, our understanding is there's, um, you know, uh, the uh, CCC self-declaration and then there's a uh, voluntary uh, certifica certification process uh, that includes uh, application documents, factory preparation, and then, uh, other, uh, you know, all, all kinds of payments and fees. 
Uh, man, two of the, um, uh, I think the two most important elements of the CCC certification uh, are product testing. Uh, uh, the, this is basically products are to be certified uh, and then you have to send it to a Chinese laboratory for them to be tested and also uh, factory audits. audits. So uh, that means inspection by the product manufacturers, uh, by the Chinese auditors. Uh, for example, uh, if you are exporting meat products uh, to China, uh, in addition to the uh, federal government and health authorities the certification of the uh, company, uh, of the uh, uh, manufacturer or the, um, uh, the facility, uh, the slaughterhouse to have the ability to uh, export outside of China, the Chinese authority also needs to come in and then uh, do an audit of the uh, manufacturer or the, uh, uh, the slaughterhouse or the packing facility in order for you to be able to uh, obtain certification and an ability to uh, export to China. So uh, it is a very important component, get ahead of it, work with your legal counsel and the Chinese um, uh, counterparts uh, to get that before you start shipping. Don't uh, get your shipped uh, you know, products over there and then the customs, uh, you know, stop it and then send it back. Excellent, thanks. Um, another question. Um, so before a Canadian exporter sells in China, is there any special liability insurance that uh, someone should consider uh, before having products distributed in China? Sure. Are, are we talking about uh, uh, just general business liability insurance for uh, a breaching a contract, or um, uh, that's the only thing come up to, come to the top of my mind? And uh, if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, any kind of international bulk product shipping, uh, there's also separate insurance uh, that could be a purchase or sometimes a mandate uh, by the uh, by the um, uh, by the buyer. I think. Uh, uh, check with your logistic, uh, you know, suppliers. Uh, I think it was, um, it was Mr. Lee before, um, yeah. you know, John uh, is probably the better consultant to answer those questions. What kind of insurance are required? Okay. Okay. Um, and maybe just uh, like a final question before we, uh, we, we move on. Um, we often think of China as a place where the Guangxi or the, the interpersonal relationship is, is more important than contracts. Um, do you have any suggestion on how to bring on the table a supply agreement or any kind of contract for newcomers going to uh, do business in China? Well, uh, Guanxi, I think it's real human relationship is important in any scenario. And to find a, a trustworthy partner or a, or a business, um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, partner in China is uh, as important as in China, as in Canada, US or anywhere else. Um, uh, the Chinese legal system is also undergoing drastic changes. Uh, a new laws are coming into uh, uh, place, I think in 2021, uh, that deal was property, deal with uh, personal assets. So be aware of the legal regimes, uh, work with uh, you know, your partners, uh, identify and um, vet your partners, and uh, you know, talk to a few different people, uh, ex uh, work with uh, you know, uh, your, your consultants, uh, and I guess, you know, just as you're doing business anywhere else, China is a vast market. Uh, it's a different culture. It has a very different business culture. But um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a market where a lot of people made a lot of money. And then there's a, uh, the fastest growing middle class. So it's a market worth going to. And I think that's why we're having this conversation, right? Excellent. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, well, Cindy and Victor, thank you very much for answering these questions. Uh, this will unfortunately close our, our legal portion of the event. Uh, before we let you go, I would like to remind the audience again that uh, you can reach me or, or DS Avoca uh, for, for further information on this topic. Um, I will now invite uh, Emily Delphi, Product Operations Lead, and Kevin Sullivan, Senior Manager, Mid-Market at Export Development Canada, to join me on screen. Um, Kevin, Emily, thank you for participating today. I will now give you the floor to tell us more about some of the assistance available to Canadian exporters. And I will also make sure that you are on screen. Yes, you are. Thank you very much, Philip. 
and thank you to uh, to all the participants as well. Uh, as as mentioned, um, myself, uh, Kevin Sullivan, uh, senior manager with with EDC, and uh, my colleague Emily will will talk uh, high level of uh, about EDC, provide a bit of a history, but but uh, get straight into uh, a bit of details on precisely how EDC can help those on the line as you're looking to pursue new opportunities in China. So quick uh, agenda here, um, again, high level, uh, the, the pillars of EDC, uh, touching on the protection, how, how can we provide top cover, uh, protect you and your business, uh, mainly primarily against the, the risk of, of non-payment when doing business in China. Uh, and then into financing and bonding solutions that we have available to you. And, uh, and then Emily, uh, we'll pass it over to Emily as well to talk on the knowledge solutions that EDC has and the, the connections piece as well. So Emily, if you'd just like to move on to the next slide. So EDC, who are we, uh, what we do and, and why we're in the market? We are an export credit agency, um, which is not uh, novel to Canada. Uh, most countries, uh, industrialized countries globally have an ECA. Some play a little bit different roles than others, but essentially it is, uh, we are in place uh, in the market to provide solutions specifically uh, to address challenges that come about when doing business internationally. So we, we work in partnership with your financial institution uh, other other service providers, accounting, uh, law firms as well, to provide uh, tailored solutions to uh, help you get over some of the challenges that, that you may face uh, while penetrating new markets. So we, we are uh, financially self-sustaining. Uh, we operate in commercial principles. So we are a lender, uh, first and foremost. So we don't have, you know, grants um, uh, or kind of uh, lending um, facilities available for um, non-market. We, we lend to market and we work in partnership with financial institutions, both in Canada and internationally. So domestically, we are uh, across the country. Uh, so for those of you on the line in, in cities from east to west, north to south, uh, we have a market presence, uh, boots on the ground in market here. Uh, so whether it's, uh, if you're in, in Toronto, feel free to reach out. Um, the same in Newfoundland, uh, Yukon or BC, reach out to us and we will put you in touch with colleagues uh, in, in offices located uh, where you are. Globally, we, um, you know, we have uh, quite a presence internationally as well. We are co-located with the uh, Trade Commissioner Services as well as having our own standalone uh, branches as well. Uh, it, as far as Asia goes, in, in China specifically, we are in, in Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Uh, quite a presence as well in in, uh, in Singapore, uh, Indonesia, as well as uh, as Australia. So, just a quick look at uh, at EDC's balance sheet. We <clears throat> numbers at a glance. We were were operating and active in about 180 countries globally. Uh, balance sheet and, and lending in market uh, about 104 uh, billion. Um, one important thing to note here is that 84% of our, our clients are in the small, medium-sized enterprise space. So we, yes, we work with large corporates, um, but just as we work with these large corporates and, and apply the solutions we have available, if you have if you're a company with one export sale, we we can also apply those same solutions here as well. Uh, and so even, even before you're looking to uh, venture into a new, new market, we have solutions available both on the knowledge side uh, and in the financial solutions that, uh, that we'll talk on today. So jumping into it here, <clears throat> kind of the, the three pillars of, of EDC um, are, you know, the history of EDC. At, we were established in 1945, obviously during uh, a challenging time globally, where there are a lot of opportunity, uh, whether it be in Europe, uh, in Asia, or elsewhere, after the Second World War, lots of infrastructure projects available, engineering, services, products. Uh, so a lot of opportunity globally, but a challenge uh, that we face as, as Canadians was 
you know, where are the good opportunities? Uh, where can we engage in business? Knowing that we're working with reputable partners and bottom line, knowing that we're going to get paid. Uh, so the insurance, the, the trade credit coverage that EDC provides, uh, bottom line is as you look to engage with a new customer, establish a new relationship, work with your legal team to draft contracts, you know, arrive at an agreement on contractual obligations. If you follow through, you will get paid. If we're covering you, uh, we, we make sure that you get paid. Uh, we work together with you and your customers to understand the risk, understand the volumes, understand the project, the scope, the capabilities of both parties. And if we're there to protect you, bottom line, at the end of the day, you get paid. Things happen in supply chains that are out of everybody's control. So if your customer is not in a position where they are able to pay you, we step in uh, and, and we, we foot the bill. On the financing side, so as you bring on that new business, knowing that you're going to be protected, knowing that you're going to get paid at the end of the day, challenges still exist where you have financial obligations up front. Perhaps you have suppliers that you need to pay in advance. You need to build out that inventory. You need to hire, pay uh, your employees. So oftentimes is that upfront cost uh, of winning new business. There's a celebration, you, you know, one contract lands, two contracts is great. And then the third arrives and say, and if you're in a position where you're not quite sure if you're going to be able to fit that through your working capital facilities and the relationship you have with the bank. Um, that's where we come in again, working in partnership with your financial institution uh, to make sure that you have the working capital in place uh, to fulfill your, your contractual obligations. And then on the knowledge piece, uh, I'll let uh, Emily jump into that as, as we go forward. So insurance, <clears throat> we uh, just next slide, uh, Emily, that'd be great. So in the insurance piece, uh, the trade credit coverage, um, what it is, it protects you in, in making sure that you get paid, but what it helps you do and how it enables you to gain leverage in negotiations, uh, offer the terms that your customers are looking for, uh, win that business, and it, and it allows you to uh, compete locally and offer terms that are dictated by that market, knowing that you're going to get paid but it also provides you additional leverage and negotiation in, in protecting that balance and protecting your profits. Uh, you know, we all do it, uh, negotiating a, a final deal where you're expected to you know, shave that last, last little bit off instead of providing um, concessions on pricing. Oftentimes, you know, cash is king, but cash flow is the lifeblood of a business. If you're in a position where you're able to offer the 30 or 60, or 90 day payment terms that your customer is asking for, uh, even from the first sale, it, uh, it provides you with the ability to uh, grow that relationship, show the trust and show that long-term view, which is, which is very important in, in China and other markets, but particularly in China, uh, if you're in a position where you can offer that, uh, win the business, uh, show that trust, offer the terms, knowing you're going to get paid, uh, it's a very uh, powerful tool that, uh, that can be used. Emily, we could just push on to the next. So as mentioned, you protect your profits uh, in your balance sheet. Uh, again, it's at 90%. So if uh, at a million dollar opportunity, it's, it would be 900,000 where, where you're being protected by EDC. So you still maintain that 10% skin in the game. Um, you know, it oft also helps you in your relationship with your bank in accessing more working capital. So in your relationships with, with your financial institutions, you know, oftentimes you're in a situation where a facility may be margined, where you provided 75% of value on perhaps domestic and North American receivables. If you are protecting a receivable, even if in it's in um, Tianjin, China, or Shanghai, or Beijing, your bank doesn't know that risk, but if the EDC coverage is on there, or EDC or, or another private insurer, uh, if you're being protected on that risk, your bank will then be in a position to provide you with the, the financing, uh, leveraging the security, taking an assignment of that receivable. Uh, so, you know, it not only helps you knowing you're going to get paid, but it helps you with your relationship with your bank as well. 
Emily will just, uh, next slide, please. So I threw in a, a case study here with, it was actually a company that came to us uh, about six years ago through CCBC, where they had an opportunity in Hong Kong, um, where they had negotiated, they went to a trade show in Hong Kong, they had uh, engaged with a party uh, at this trade show. Uh, and as they were negotiating, it was very clear that this party in, in Hong Kong, which was you know, offering to represent them in, in mainland China as well and, and greater Asia uh, markets, they, they needed some terms. They, they, they were, the requirement was 60 day payment terms uh, for a test order. Uh, so it was you know, a, a, about an $80,000 uh, USD contract opportunity in Hong Kong. Uh, but the Canadian company just wasn't in a position to uh, to take that risk. It was a new market for them, a new customer. Uh, it was an online platform, which they didn't know much about, but it turned out to be, you know, one of the big ones. Uh, think of JD.com, Alibaba. So it was a very good opportunity, but one that they ended up turning away. Uh, they attended a seminar. They, they learned about the EDC solution uh, in play here. And they came to us and they said, look, this is the, this is the risk. Can you have a look at it. We said, sure, the name, address, and phone number, uh, bring it on and we'll have a look. Uh, it turned out that you know, the risk was, was very good, very attractive. We were, we were quite comfortable uh, protecting the risk against this opportunity. They went ahead, uh, they had a test order and did very well. So they, they then turned this, this $80,000 opportunity, a test order with an online retailer uh, in China into I believe last year that it's 16 million in the market and it represents a, a significant portion of, of their overall sales. So, you know, by showing that, taking that leap of faith, knowing that they're covered, they opened up a new uh, beachhead in this market uh, to, to grow their business. And um, so it worked out uh, quite well. Jumping into the bonding solutions. We, we included this slide. So EDC, um, as well as financing, uh, trade credit coverage. We offer a uh, bonding solutions as well in partnership with your bank And it's very relevant for Asian markets uh, Very relevant for for the China market as well again thinking online retailers where if you're going to be listed on this platform oftentimes there's a requirement to post some security a deposit a cash deposit to show that you know you've got skin in the game uh, you're going to follow through on your on your performance obligations and things like that. So EDC, again, working in partnership uh, with your bank, we can help to substitute our balance sheet for yours, uh, post the collateral necessary to issue these standby letters of credit and allowing you to not have to post the cash, instead taking the EDC guarantee, working with your bank to issue that to your customer's bank in market. And uh, again, it's a way of freeing up working capital, not having your cash tied up, uh, being unproductive. Um, and it's, it's a solution that, you know, whether it's performance bonds, warranty bonds, uh, if you're bidding on a contract, there may be a bid bond. Uh, there are many, many types of bonding requirements uh, involved with, with exporting and being in a new market. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we won't jump to the details here, but something to keep in mind if if there is a requirement for a standby LC, uh, come have a, a chat with us. So financing solutions. Again, going quickly, uh, high level, we're here to add capacity uh, to your lending uh, relationship with your financial institution when the business is just a little bit too big uh, to to handle on your own. So if, if you need to really scale up in a hurry, uh, you have that significant uh, contract opportunity or a new relationship with a customer and you need to invest up front. That's a time to think about uh, EDC. Uh, again, working with your bank to, to increase operating lines, uh, creating new facilities uh, as foreign affiliates as well, uh, or subsidiaries. It's very challenging for a Canadian bank to gain comfort in lending to a foreign affiliate or a subsidiary when it's located in market. Conversely, it's very difficult for a bank in that market to get comfortable in lending to a subsidiary because 
you know, your security, your track record, your reputation is in your local country. Uh, so again, taking EDC's guarantee, applying it to your banking relationship, either in Canada uh, or in China, these are some of the solutions that um, that we have and, and you can uh, approach us uh, on that as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump right into the next one, uh, Emily, and, and go quickly on this, perhaps uh, jumping into the scenario uh, or case study, one that uh, is a Canadian company, they are in uh, the cosmetics space. So it's a consumer product, um, online retail, and they've done extremely well in the Chinese market. Um, having said that, there are a number of challenges that that they faced and continue to face uh, when uh, expanding into to China, namely, you know, growing, needing that working capital to to expand in the market. But their inventory was either on a boat in the market in China, in a warehouse in Tianjin, Shenzhen, uh, Shanghai, or Beijing. So their inventory was everywhere. Uh, their bank did not like that. Um, so it's difficult to, from a debt perspective, get comfortable to lend in a situation like that. Uh, so taking the EDC solutions, both on the protecting the revenue stream, so protecting the risk, providing guarantee support and establishing working capital facilities. Uh, so in this case, it was you know, an asset like company uh, inventory located in market supplier payment terms as well were a challenge where they needed to pay some of their suppliers up front. And so we helped with uh, some supplier guarantees as well so that we could uh, extend the payment terms that they were getting from their suppliers, uh, which is another very useful tool that we, we have in play here. Um, and then they had to issue uh, standby letters of credit, both to suppliers and their customers. So a combination of EDC's financing guarantees, uh, trade credit coverage, uh, and bonding solutions uh, to help the company grow exponentially. I think the first year in China, they did about 2 million in sales. Uh, I think this year they've, uh, they're approaching 100 million. So it, a number of uh, you know, challenges that they had, uh, but working together with, with EDC uh, and their bank, we, we were able to come up with solutions to, uh, to allow them to succeed. So I'll stop it there. Um, questions on the end, bring, bring them on, please. And I'll, I'll pass it over to my, my colleague, Emily, to talk about our knowledge solutions. Awesome, thanks, Kevin. Next, I'm gonna dive into an additional offering that EDC provides, which is our knowledge solutions as well as our advisory services. So just jumping right into it, this is just a quick overview of some of the solutions I'm gonna discuss with you today. So first and foremost, all the knowledge solutions at EDC are actually offered free of charge. They can all be accessed through our website and I've included links in this presentation so that afterwards feel free to browse through them. So the first one I'd like to discuss with you today is Export Help, which is our export advisor service. So Export Help is a free navigational service for Canadian companies that have export related questions. EDC's expert advisors can help you find information and resources, identify key contacts, as well as provide targeted referrals to partners. So you can move forward confidently in your export journey. So at, for Export Help, we can offer services to a very broad range of companies as well as on a very broad range of topics. So for example, I've listed some of the topics that we can help with here, locating these main buckets. We can help companies of all sizes and all sectors of all maturity levels. So this is really a service for, for all Canadian companies that might have a small knowledge gap in their export journey that they want some help with. Just going to go into this quick case study. So export help case study. Um, so Kate owns a seafood company and has identified a growing interest for her product in China. However, it would be a new market for her and is worried about adhering to necessary regulations. So this is an example of the kind of information that Expert Help could provide to this customer. So Expert Help could provide information after researching for her specific needs and to fit her profile and tailor to her profile's needs, regulatory information on exporting food products from Canada to China, market intelligence for the seafood sector in China. So we can actually pull pretty, pretty direct reports that we can provide to her all free of charge, as well as government grant programs that Kate may be able to qualify for that might not be on her radar. And then provide referrals to relevant contacts who can further assist her. So in this specific example, 
we had provided Kate with the information to AAFC as well as the Canadian Society of Customs Brokers for her next steps on these questions. Next, I'm just going to go over high level some of the some of the other knowledge solutions that are offered on EDC's website. So first off, webinars as well as trade information. So EDC hosts webinars once every, we do it around twice a month, as well as publishing economic outlooks, white papers, blogs on various trade related topics. And again, these can all be accessed on demand for free on our website. Forum for International Trade Training, also known as FIT, is a non-for-profit organization that provides courses to help exporters become accredited as well as learn more about various knowledge gap topics that, may, that they may have. So in partnership with EDC and FIT, we have launched the Light Learning Series, which again can be accessed through our website. And it's a variety of online courses and workshops that are built to help exporters, usually in the early stages of their journey, to increase knowledge on various topics, whether it be managing cash flow or doing an international market analysis. These are some of the self-serving digital tools that we have on our website as well. So this, the first one, Company Insights. Company Insights allow exporters to do a background check on their own on the foreign buyer or partner that they might be looking to do, to do business with. So this is definitely a very popular one for our exporters that are doing business in China. The Export Help Hub. So the Export Help Hub is a pre-curated um, online tool where companies can go and access previous content that the Export Help advise advisors have formulated for other companies. So we have a lot of the top questions that we see from our exporters and we have it there online for ease of use. And lastly, Enlist. So Enlist is a online database search tool that exporters can use to find reliable service providers to fit your specific needs. So again, you can go online and you can type in um, whatever market, whatever sector you're in, and they can show you examples of service providers that you can have access to to help you along your export journey. So that's everything that we have to present with you today. Um, we've included this slide for contact information. As Kevin mentioned, we do have colleagues in the offices in Greater China. So we've included their contact information as well as our own. So if you have any questions at all about anything we've presented on today or just additional questions and you'd like to chat, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Ali, Kevin, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Um, maybe just uh, a few questions uh, additionally. Um, we typically, and just to clarify, we typically think of, maybe some typically think of DDC as an assistant, uh, as, some, as an organization that can help with export of goods. Um, I, I was kind of wondering if there's some assistance that can be provided to exporters of services uh, that would go, that would be destined to China. Uh, absolutely. Uh, just jump in there on, on the EDC solution side. We treat a, a service uh, and an, uh, a physical product the, the exact same. So, it, you know, there are some intricacies, uh, you know, and challenges, as mentioned in the, the case study, where it's an, uh, an asset light company, which service companies typically are. But absolutely, if it's a service agreement or service contract, there's an obligation to pay, we can protect that. Uh, also, you know, on the financing side, if there's a, a contract opportunity, uh, you win that business, there, there are going to be working capital uh, challenges associated with that, um, that piece of business. And, uh, and absolutely, we uh, are strongly positioned to, to work in partnership with, uh, with your bank to, to support that. And from the knowledge perspective as well, if I may jump in, we can also provide specific information for service providers. So we understand that the needs are very different from those that may be selling tangible goods. So that includes topics such as visa requirements, uh, moving people across borders, and what, what it looks like if you have consultants on the other side of the border and such. So we can definitely provide information on that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, something that came out also of your presentation, you were talking, Emily, I believe, about the company insight um, functions. Um, again, to clarify, is that a serve? So you, you mentioned that uh, companies can go and do background checks uh, themselves about uh, partners in China. Is that a service that is free of charge? Uh, is there a fee to this or, or how does it work precisely? 
Yeah, so on our website, we have this tool. And again, I've included the link in the presentation. So it'll be accessible to everyone afterwards. And after you make a login for, we call it My IDC registration, you simply just put in some information about your company's profile so that we can provide tailored information to you. And you can access all these online tools. So it's a self-serve database. So companies can type in the name of the foreign partner that they're looking to do business with, as well as the country. And then it'll show up whatever information we have on them on our database. Excellent. Thanks. Um, another question, and it, I hope this is not a bit too specific, but I, there, there's a program with EDC that's called the Foreign Exchange Facility uh, Guarantee. Um, how does that differ with typical edging from, from banks or traditional institutions? So it, it, essentially, Philip, it's a, it's helps to augment uh, or add capacity to your hedging facilities that you would have with your, your bank or your, or your uh, FX trading desk. So we don't, uh, we don't uh, provide this uh, service in market. It's, it's a very well served uh, market. That said, oftentimes when you are doing business in uh, markets that are further afield, there may be uh, a, uh, a requirement to go further out in a hedging contract, say for example, 12 months or further. Typically, uh, FIs or, or, or trading desks will, will have a challenge with uh, a longer duration, uh, or if it's a, a large amount, depending on the relationship you have, they may require some collateral there. Uh, so that's, that's where we come into play. We will post uh, a guarantee it's 100% guaranteed to the financial institution, uh, unsecured, unconditional guarantee, which again adds adds capacity, and helps to go up longer. So that we've identified that as a, as a gap where where we can play, uh, and play a role to uh, to help uh, strengthen the, the Canadian company's position. Great, thank you for that. Um, again, touching on something that was mentioned in the presentation uh, on Market Insight, I believe you've mentioned that EDP can support uh, exporters in finding uh, partners or, or markets. Um, we're happy to do the same, obviously, with our members, but I'm wondering, is that something that uh, is done through the portal at EDC? Do we need to, does a company need to contact a, an EDC partner to discuss uh, finding partners in China, how does that uh, work exactly? Yeah, absolutely. So you can, um, companies can contact your point of contact. So let's say, for example, you're working with an account manager, then you can chat with them. You can contact the export help team and we can help you as well. Um, or you can also contact our, our uh, colleagues in, in China. So what we can provide, for example, from the export help team is that we can, we can actually look at your company's profile and provide tailored referrals to other organizations as well as programs that we think may be beneficial to you. So some of the organizations that uh, of course, we work very close with, cl closely with is Trade Commissioner Service. Um, however, we can also provide referrals to, for example, foreign government entities, um, and association, industry associations in foreign markets, um, whether it be, you know, needing to work with freight forwarders, lawyers, customs brokers, accountants even, we can provide referrals there as well. And we also have a lot of partnerships, of course, EDC does. So we leverage those and can provide very targeted referrals. And I'll let Kevin jump in as well. And, and dovetailing with, with, with that, we using the uh, kind of EDC's top cover, the trade credit covers that we have, whether it's one customer or, uh, you know, we can look and basically do a scan of um, the customers that, that you're looking at from a financial risk perspective. So what we do is, you know, we, we gather information and we draw information from dozens of credit agencies. China specifically, we partner with SinoSure. So they help us understand the risk in that market. Uh, and by doing that, it's a very useful exercise in weeding out and targeting who you are doing business with in this market. You know, we all put our best foot forward and, you know, attending a trade show or, uh, you know, that introductory meeting, but we get to see behind the curtain and, and see, you know, what kind of opportunity is this? If it's a, a million dollar opportunity with, um, a company that you met at a, at a trade show, uh, you know, we may come back and say, great opportunity, go for it. Um, you know, we're comfortable with this risk. Or we may come back and say, you know, <clears throat> the fundamentals are strong here. 
you know, their equity position is good, their balance sheet's okay, uh, but we're not quite comfortable with a million. Let's have a look at it. You know, five hundred thousand dollar opportunity because that's that's the risk that we see being there. Uh, or we may come back and say, this is not a risk we're willing to take. Uh, you know, we we've looked at their balance sheet, we see their financials, we we've contacted credit agencies. You know, they're in you know on average eighty days paying late. Um, you know, they're in a in tough position. They've got claims against them. It's a no go. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that's a bad news to get, uh, but it's good news in the end. Um, you know, we had a client that that had us, you know, containers of, of goods ready to go to a customer in China. And, and we took a deeper look at it and we said, this is this risk is is not something that that we would like to take and, and nor should you. So <clears throat> unfortunately, it was it was a bad situation uh, immediately. But long term, it was a good one because, you know, they came to us with with other customers and other potential opportunities in China. And we said, this, this looks great. Uh, so it's not so much on the connections and introductions side, but so Emily can help you with that. But on this side, you know, we can, you know, brass tacks, if you have an opportunity, we can let you know if it's a good one or not. Uh, which is obviously a big part. Uh, I mean, it, it's always awful to learn that you're losing a sale, but losing a sale plus your goods because it went south is, is not a very good way, good situation. So I appreciate the uh, obvious support that DDC can, can supply. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're coming to the end of our time today. Uh, before closing today's meeting, I would like to remind everyone in the audience that next week on Thursday, August 20th, we will be presenting the latest information on IP protection in China. I invite everyone to register to the event. In fact, your Zoom browser window, sh window should already be open to the registration page if you desire to do so. Um, Emily and Kevin, thank you very much for, for the answering the questions and for the presentation. Also, I, I would like to say thank you to John Lee of DTS Advanced Logistics, Victor Tsao and Cindy O of DS Avoca Canada, and, and Emily and, um, and Kevin as well, again, uh, at, Export, at EDC Export Development Canada for participating in today's presentation. Thank you all. Um, to everyone on this panel and in the audience, I wish you a great day and we will see you again very soon.